the scripture reading this morning, the Easter scripture, comes from the third chapter of the book of Genesis. That soon in creation, God says to the one who would steal our joy, the one who would bring, want to bring sin and transgression into the world, says to that old enemy, Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In the third chapter of Genesis, that's God saying, I'm going to send a savior. I am going to send someone to deal with that justice that must be done. If God had been lying to Adam and Eve, if God had said, you are surely going to die, and didn't intend that there be a penalty for sin, then he couldn't possibly be God, because he, that would make him a liar, and he could not be God if he was untrue. And so justice had to happen, and God said, what I'm going to do, since separation from me is the penalty for sin, someone else is going to come and is going to endure that on behalf of all of the rest of creation. And we remember on the cross, Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I can't be sure because it doesn't explain in the Bible what that was that Jesus was feeling, but I suspect that that is the one time in all of the history of mankind, and it's the last time in all of the history of mankind, when God turned his back and walked away. You and I who are part of the church, somehow or other, to others can explain how it has felt for us to have God in our lives. We know, most of us anyway, what it was like before God was in our lives, before he was present with us and walking with us in our lives. Try and conceive what it would be like to all of a sudden feel that emptiness, that absolute desertion of God saying, you're on your own. I believe that that's what Jesus experienced at that moment on the cross. And that was the penalty for our sins being passed on to him, that desertion, that separation from God. So one of the first prophecies of the Bible speaks about God's plan for reestablishing the relationship that was destroyed by sin. God said, don't do that. And mankind said, I'm going to do that. And somehow, justice had to be performed. As we read through the Bible, beginning at the Old Testament, we see God's plan unfolding. We see God working through a process with his chosen people to show them his love. The process that he had established so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Throughout the history of that nation of Israel, God is demonstrating his love to his people. He's trying to preserve a rebellious people. And as we read through the Old Testament particularly, we see it's a series of ups and downs and ups and downs as far as the people are concerned in their response to God. Oh yes, there is only one God. We will worship him. We will worship him only. 
oh, Moses is up the mountain. Let's make ourselves a golden calf. Um, God punishes the people. Oh, well, he is the, the one and only true God. We better, we give all our devotion to him. And then something else comes along. Somebody offers strange fire in the tabernacle. And God has to go back and deal with his rebellious people again. We celebrate on Resurrection Sunday the grand fulfillment of the exchange that God engineered for all of us today. Originally it was, you will die. And God said, because I'm a just God and a loving God, death is necessary, a dying is necessary, a separation from me is necessary, but I am going to put into my plan a way to, for you to be able to circumvent, shall we say, that punishment. In Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse, I'm reading from the message. We read these words. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their walk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them. But they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you're walking along? And they just stood there long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Now, there's an understatement, if I ever heard one. Because that's exactly what they thought had happened. They had lost their best friend. And then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, Are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened? during the last few days? Jesus said, what has happened? And they said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. And then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death and crucified him. We had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it's now the third day since it happened. But now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. And then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted. Why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? And then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. Imagine what it would be like to walk with this man the dusty roads to Emmaus and have him start at Genesis and go to Deuteronomy and then move on into what the Jews call the Tanakh, which is the rest of the what we would call the Old Testament, and share with them how God had planned to save mankind from all sin from the very beginning. And as they walked along, Jesus most assuredly would have shared with them Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, which said, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There in a nutshell is what happened to Jesus. The prophecy that was given to Isaiah. He took our pain. He bore our suffering. And we, seeing all of that, considered that it was a, like a punishment from God. And that in our minds, anyway, God had afflicted him and God had uh, stricken him. But the truth of the matter is, all of this happened, as Isaiah says, for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. In other words, Isaiah is saying, he took it so that we wouldn't have to endure it. And by his wounds, we are healed. Let me give you a dramatic revelation on this Resurrection Sunday. God is not mad at you. God has forgiven you of all of those things that you have confessed to him. The scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The truth of the matter is, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We trip, we stumble, we fall, we try to do the best we can, we slip. And my sense is that we go to God and we say, Lord God, I confess to you such and such a sin a little while ago. And God... I've done it again. And when we pray that with honesty, God says, done what again? Because it's forgotten. When it's confessed, that's it. God does not keep a record of our sins. And so Paul can write to the Roman church, there is there. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gave life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now you sense there that there is a certain requirement on our part. There are people who will say, well, you know, put your faith in Jesus and everything's just fine beginning to end. But there's a certain response that's required. We do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. And Paul is saying, God went through a process with his people. And he told them, you must perform certain sacrifices in the temple. Year after year after year after year. Part of the purpose behind that, to get it into people's minds, that performance is not the thing that is going to bring salvation. It is not by works. And the, the people of God, the chosen people of God, learned very quickly, I'm sure, that it was not by works that they were going to be saved. Because they had to do the works every year. The sinless lamb had to be slain in each family every year for the sins of the people. The scapegoat had to have 
the hands of the priest that laid upon him at Rosh Hashanah, and all, transferring all of the sins of all of the people of Israel onto that goat's head. And then they would drive the goat out into the wilderness and make sure that it fell over a cliff somewhere so it didn't bring the sins of the people back into the camp. It starts to sound a lot like superstition if you do it that way. And of course, God is saying it's not by works. Even before Paul wrote it, God's saying it's not by works. You're going to have to do this every year because you keep falling short. That's just the way humankind is. And things haven't changed much except that Jesus is risen from the dead. He's been crucified for us. His, shed has, his blood has been shed. His body's been broken. And the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world has indeed taken away the sin of the world forever for those that live not by the flesh but according to the Spirit. So they're walking along on that road to... Emmaus and the disciples say, but we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. Well, indeed, he was the one that was going to deliver Israel, but in a whole different way than they ever expected. They were looking for someone who was going to come in and overthrow the Roman government. They were expecting, in their minds, Messiah to them was the one who was going to come and was going to rule in the flesh, on earth, as a governor. And that was not what God intended. From the very beginning of creation, God gave the assurance of his love. He's essentially saying, watch what I will do for you. I am the God who loves you, who created you, who wants the very best for you. Just keep your eyes open and see what I'm going to do. And if they had, if they'd been watching... They would have seen that this God does what he, what he says he'll do. He's delivered his chosen people from slavery. And as he delivers them from slavery, he's given them the assurance of his protection. And it's only when they lose their faith in his protection that they end up wandering around in the wilderness. It takes 11 days to go from Egypt to the promised land. It took them 40 years because the people just did not believe when God said, don't worry about it. I'm going to get you through whatever you think might be out there waiting for you. It's my plan that you should live, that you should be uh, delivered into the promised land, the land of milk and honey. A bunch of guys come back and they lie about what they see and the people believe it and they end up wandering until a whole generation has come and gone. And of course we know the history that even then <laughs> they haven't completely learned the lesson. God could have just wiped out the world and started somewhere else if he had chosen to do that. But God doesn't work that way. We've come to understand that God is not that kind of a God who uh, fires lightning bolts at his people when they stray off the track. He's not a, he's not a God who hates his creation when it goes astray. He took action against wrongdoers, yes. But he preserved those who were faithful. They had their failings, but they were seeking to do what is right. I mean, I be, you know, they were saying, I believe in God. But sometimes I don't quite understand what God wants me to do, or I, you know, I'm tempted astray, but then they come back to God. And so those that were totally determined to be against God were the ones that, that suffered. But God's plan mostly was correction rather than destruction. From the very beginning, God gave his people hope. He preserved 
the Israelites through their growth as a nation and through their desert wanderings. And then he sent Jesus as fulfillment of that Genesis promise to destroy the enemy, Satan. Let's try this out. There are eight specific prophecies about Jesus. Just, we'll take these eight. Christ, the prophecy said, was to be born in Bethlehem. He was to have a forerunner that would prepare the way. That was his cousin John. Christ was to enter Jerusalem riding a donkey, the prophecy said. He was to be betrayed by a friend, the prophets told us. He was to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. How particular can you get? And those 30 pieces of silver were to be cast down and used to buy a potter's field. Although innocent, Jesus was to keep silent when he was on trial. And finally, he was to be crucified. How do we know that the prophets were right? How do we know that Jesus was the promised Savior? The odds of Jesus fulfilling all eight of those prophecies about the Messiah were 1 in 10 to the 27th power. That's a 10 followed by 27 zeros. I can't even tell you what that number represents. There's, you know, there's a joke about uh, someone who comes from Brazil and they say, we have a Brazilian. And somebody says, well, how many more than a billion is that? 27 zeros. I don't, I don't know what you'd call that number. You know, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, sept sextillions, septillions, uh, oct ten octillion to one. You know. Um, given this and the time span between the writings of the prophets and the fulfillment of those prophecies, they prophet the prophecies were either given to the prophets by God, or the prophets just wrote them down as they thought they should be. Can you just imagine some prophet sitting in his office somewhere saying, hey, Zeke, let's say this guy is going to be betrayed for 30 coins. And the other guy says, hey, tell you what, not only are we going to have him betrayed for 30 coins, but the guy that gets the money, after he realizes what he's done, he's not going to want it anymore and throw it away. Let's write that down. That's not the way it went. It's not the prophet saying, well, you know, let's, let's just give it a try, see if we can get it right. That's God talking to his people and saying, this is what we're going to do. This is what I want to do because I'm a God who cares. So from the beginning, there was hope. Third chapter of Genesis, God says, I'm going to send a Savior. Through the prophets, God says, this is how you're going to know that he's the one that I sent. Here are the prophecies. As they are fulfilled, you will know that this is the one that I've sent. We were at the Lord's table this morning, and Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. God looked after our healing. He looked after our healing at the whipping post before he completed the plan on the cross. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We can't truly grasp what Jesus went through so that we might be healed. I don't care what you say about what you think the experience was. You can watch depictions of the scourging, but at the end of it all, it's not real because it is a depiction. You can watch the Passion of the Christ and close your eyes at those images of blood and brutality and torn flesh. But when the lights come on, it was only a movie and it was just Jim Caviezel in makeup and a loincloth. 
you have no, we have no concept of what Jesus went through at the whipping post. And let me assure you that it wasn't just a few lashes, that um, it was Romans, it was not Jews that flogged him. And they usually picked the biggest, meanest, strongest, ugliest guy that they could find. And then they literally beat Jesus to within an inch of his life with a cat of nine tails that had bits of glass, bits of metal, and anything that they could think of that would tear flesh on the end of those things. And by those stripes, Isaiah says, by the punishment that he received, we are healed. He took the pain that we would have to endure so that we wouldn't have to put up with that. In the Exodus, for the health of a nation, God does the same thing. God moves in and he takes a stand for the health of the people. Now, it's a different kind of a process. But you'll remember, I'm sure you'll remember, as you read through particularly the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy, how God said, these are things that you must do as you go through the wilderness and after you establish your nation and so on. There are certain kinds of food that you must not eat or certain edible things. It's not really food because he knew it wasn't something they should eat. There are certain things that you must not eat because if you do, not it won't be me that punishes you, but you will make yourself so sick that, that you won't be a strong nation anymore. Don't eat the wild boars because they got trichinosis. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. Don't drink the water. Don't eat these other animals that are essentially scavengers because they may be healthy to you, but what they've got in them probably was diseased and that's going to be passed on to you. So if you want to be my people, if you want to be a strong nation, if you want to be able to endure the challenges that you're going to face when you are overcoming the land, you've got, to be, you've got to be in good health. And this is how you're going to be in good health. Now, the interesting thing is we can go back when we were saying, you know, are the, the prophecies show that Jesus was the Messiah. Think about this for a minute. In Egypt, their method of healing or treating disease went something like this. Take the um, ground powdered remains of a dead frog. Add the dung of a goat. Mix in a little bit of water from this particular spring that's high in some kind of mineral and so on. Um, you need the liver from a dead something or other, and grind it up, put it all together, either apply it as a poultice, or eat it, or drink it, and that is going to make you well. Egyptians didn't live terribly long. But you can read through the whole of the Old Testament, and never, ever will you hear Moses sharing with the people any of what the Egyptians did as far as their universal health care was concerned. Everything that Moses said was for the health and the strength of the nation, and he completely abandoned the ways of the Egyptians. He went in with God's health, God's teaching about how to be strong. And that's how the people of Israel made it through those 40 years in the wilderness. Nowhere, anywhere in the Pentateuch, in the writings of Moses, will you see him saying, uh, you need these weird things that the Egyptians used. So God preserved his people on their journey. He promised them a promised land. He promised them that they would get safely to where they were going to go. And as long as they listened, they got there. Deuteronomy 29.5. 
This is the miraculous thing. The Lord says, during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. When God says, I'm going to get you to where you need to be, he makes every step, takes every step that's necessary to fulfill that promise. God has everything under control. If I was talking to Nadia here, I would say, Todo va a estar bien. Everything's going to be just fine. That's what God says. And now we celebrate that event, which is the resurrection. Not some kind of a fantasy tale. Not something that, that uh, somebody's put together as a story to try and convey some kind of a legend or a myth. But history. This really happened. This was not an event just to bring Jesus back for the sake of the disciples. Not just for those ones that followed him around the Holy Land. Jesus didn't rise from the dead just to make them happy. But it was to fulfill that prophecy of God from the book of Genesis, what we call the book of Genesis. I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head, you'll wound his heel. There's been a war between Satan and mankind since the fall. The enemy tried to work against Jesus throughout his ministry. You note, we've just come, those of you that, are, that have been in the liturgical churches where they celebrate Lent, that 40-day period, that is a remembrance of those 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness. The enemy came to him and said, turn the stones into bread. Worship me and I'll give you all of the nations of the world. Cast yourself down because Psalm 91 says that if you throw yourself down, uh, he'll send his angels. Well, that's a misinterpretation of scripture. The enemy tried to work against Jesus throughout his ministry, and he seemed to have won at the arrest and trial. And he seemed to have won the victory at the cross. But the image that I have in my mind is that the enemy had his head crushed when that stone was rolled away. God said, I had a plan, and you didn't listen. And so you suffer the consequences. And it's well for us to, remind, to remember that that stone that was rolled away was not rolled away to let Jesus out. It was rolled away to let us in. So that there were witnesses to the resurrection. And you and I, in a very special sense, are witnesses to that resurrection. We see and feel Jesus in our lives from day to day because he is as real now as he was back then over 2,000 years ago. So we have hope from God that there is freedom from our sin. There is healing for us through the suffering that Jesus endured. There is the promise that God's um, plan is going to be fulfilled not just for others but for us as well. And so we come to 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22 which is Paul's explanation of why we come together today. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. What had been promised was fulfilled with the resurrection. A savior had come. He had been confirmed by the fulfillment of prophecy and hope had been given. The sinless one had endured a broken body and shed blood so that in every sense we might be healed. 
And now, praise God, the tomb is empty. The Savior has risen. The bonds that had been broken by disobedience have been repaired by the obedience of the one who died for us all. And so we can experience restoration. Hope, healing, and restoration, resur re restoration through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. My prayer would be that you understand that and believe that in your heart of hearts today. I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward. There are many of us here who know what it means to say the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. It's not just a, a statement of a fact. It's not just saying historically speaking there was a man named Jesus and he came and he taught certain things and he lived for a certain period of time and then he was crucified and he died and he rose again and you know that's, that's a pretty neat miracle if you can do it. That's not what is important at this point. For our lives, it's important to know that that life, that death, that resurrection took place for each and every one of us as individuals. And the promise is that as we place our faith in him, we will receive healing and hope and restoration, the assurance of salvation. I would pray that if there's anybody here today who feels that kind of warming of their heart and that feeling that I would like to have that kind of a close relationship with God that God says he wants to have with me, that you would respond by coming forward and either having someone pray for you or praying in your mind, in your heart, that Jesus would come in and would be your Lord and Savior. It may be that you've spent all your life in church. You may have been sent to Sunday school. You may have gone to church with your friends to start with. Maybe you were fortunate enough to find a Christian partner and you went to church with them. But somehow or other, you just haven't gotten that breakthrough yet. You haven't felt that hope. You haven't experienced that healing of mind and body and spirit. You haven't experienced that restoration with God that he wants to have with us, that fellowship. And so I'm going to invite you, if you feel that way, to come forward. We will pray with you. Uh, there are... As you can see, other people in the congregation here, they can pray with you as well. I have confidence that the folks that are members of this congregation uh, will pray for you. And let me assure you that nobody's going to look at you and say, oh, well, you know, it's taken you so long to finally come around. We're going to rejoice with you if you make that decision to receive Jesus into your heart or to draw closer to him so that he can receive you into his heart, which is the more important thing so that he can have the assurance that he will receive you. Let's um, join in some worship and... Uh...